Hey all, Arlo Adams here. Just a quick word before we start the book so I can answer questions you might have in advance. First of all, your comments have been fantastic and I really appreciate your support. Thanks for listening to my books. I'm posting videos in chapter segments going forward. The average listen time right now is an hour anyway, so I'll drop them between 45 minutes and an hour at a time depending on when the chapters end. That's usually two or three chapters. I've noticed from timestamps in the comments how hard it is to pick up where you left off, and I don't know if it's a YouTube premium feature that lets me pick up where I left off when I'm watching videos, but since it helps me post weekly content anyway, and that's better for a YouTube channel, I figure why not just make it easier for everybody. Besides, I was going to wait until I hit a thousand subscribers before posting book four, so at least you get to start listening sooner this way. If you're a long hauler who prefers to listen all at once, I'll try to chain the videos so they play back to back for you when the whole thing has been released. To find out when the next chapters release, you can just punch the subscribe button and the bell icon. I'm still going to give away the Amazon gift cards when I reach 500 subscribers and then again at 1,000 subscribers and all you have to do is be a subscriber to be selected for that or possibly be selected for that so make sure you punch those buttons. I also wanted to make you all aware that I've started a Patreon account. Since I'm not one of those traditionally published authors who's out there making the mad stacks, I'd really appreciate your support, but you know, I get that that's not everybody's thing. So if it is and you want to contribute three bucks a month or whatever, uh, feel free to click the link in the description. By donating as little as three dollars a month, you're going to receive a link to listen to the latest audiobook I've posted on YouTube in its entirety, just to let you know how much I appreciate your support. And while I won't deter you from going out and using an audiobook credit or buying retail, uh, I will say paying three bucks a month and listening to what I release on YouTube when you feel like it and without having to wait will save you some cash. I guarantee that. So Patreon's easy, but it's, if it's not your jam, that's fine. No worries. If you are interested in listening to the books in their entirety, the Patreon link and other details you might be interested in will be in the comments below. If you're wondering about the background videos, a final note here, that's me playing the Warden class in Elder Scrolls Online. I figured that would be eye candy for nerds like you, and it's much better than looking at my ugly mug. Shit, I hardly look in the mirror. Now I'll stop gabbing so you can listen to the book you came for. I hope you enjoy Breaking Ground. Breaking Ground. Enora Online Book 4. Written by Arlo Adams. Narrated by Brian Mesler. Prologue The Governor of Nall, Milbury Peaks, Western Kingdom of Rubal. Governor Zane lounged with a goblet hanging limply in his grasp over the cushioned arm of his oversized chair. His backside tingled from prolonged sitting, and the beggar's queue still stretched like a serpent to the far end of the chilly hall. Guards in full plate stood motionless on either side, ornate spears planted by their boots. Their feet were probably as uncomfortable as his backside. A man from the southeastern farms near the plague barons pressed a straw hat to his chest. Decades earlier, farmers there revolted and forced Zane's father to quell their rebellion. All he'd gotten for his trouble were dead troops and years of lost labor. Now, after all these years spent repopulating the farms and returning production to pre-rebellion numbers, Warsagers detected the presence of the treacherous elf who'd led so many away during the conflict in Warrington. The mention of the Renard family name still resulted in a penalty of fifty lashes and thirty days' imprisonment. He doubted it was a coincidence that a band of do-gooders had wiped out the pirates Zane's lieutenant had hired to harass vendors on the roads when southern citizens refused to pay additional taxes. But when the troublemakers turned up in Trollsby to snag his eastern prize for a second time, before escaping to the plague barons, troubling legends arose in their wake. Body disappearing after splattering to the stone surface at the foot of the castle in Trollsby, a young mage of an esteemed line vanished after purchasing a portal to pursue the bounty Zane put on Giles Renard's head. More troubling was word from Warrington that the long-pursued half-elf former magister of the university, an enemy of his father's and traitor to the crown in her own right, was spotted in the dormitories. The girl kneeling at the farmer's feet raised her head a couple inches to sneak a gander, 
and then motion dragged Zane from his thoughts. He wondered if the white lace adorning her yet-to-blossom figure might be the remnants of her matron's betrothal dress. It bunched at her narrow hips. The governor tilted his head to one side. The girl's golden locks shone as light streamed into the long hall through the stone-framed windows behind the second-floor gallery. She was an alluring one. Her cheekbones were high, her shoulders strong yet feminine, but her meager chest bumps drew a querulous glance from the governor and king's regent. "'Tell me, Farmer Timble, how old is your daughter?' He leaned forward, setting his goblet on the arm of the chair. Tell me true now. Don't exaggerate. The farmer's voice quivered. She's f fourteen and three months, my lord. Ah. The governor cocked his chin up and leaned into his backrest. He forced an even tone over his words of admonition. So you fancy me an animal? Is that it? The farmer's wide, shocked eyes made Zane's lips quiver but he resisted the urge to smile, lest his authority be diminished. No, my lord. It's the furthest thought from my mind, my lord. Shaney's a good girl. She can cook. Cleans real good. If my lord needs a servant girl, he'd find none better. I swear it. Either the man was delusional or in denial. Maybe he didn't want to believe what he was doing. It was understandable and common. The governor stroked the air in a lazy arc with his free hand. I have no need of more servants. Speak true, Farmer Timble. What is it you hope to achieve? To make him say it aloud in the company of hundreds might snatch his delusions. Yes, my lord. Well, my lord, I, I hoped that you would give us relief from the edict mandating we tithe sixty percent of our crops. I have five children and can barely feed them. If you were to take Shaney here and reduce our burden by a mere... He paused, his lips moving as he calculated. Ten percent. Then we could better serve my lord and live up to our duties. I see. Zane turned his focus to the girl kneeling at the farmer's side. Look at me, girl. She raised her head again, her full lips pressed into a white line. Natural color filled her cheeks. The king's lords in this region admired the ones with freckles. Young farm maidens drew quite a portion of appreciation, and it pleased the king when the governor presented such gifts upon his wealthy benefactors. Concubines were always in demand among the wealthy. Zane didn't enjoy the practice, but who was he to break with a tradition followed by his line for three generations? However, this fruit was not yet ripe and he'd have no one say his father's heir and loyal servant to the Luttrell monarchy leveraged children for royal support. Farmer Timble, I will offer an arrangement if it suits you. Yes, my lord. I will cut your tithe by five percent for five years. He waved a hand at the scribe sitting at a small table, and the man scribbled furiously in his ledger. In exchange... You will return with Shaney upon her sixteenth birthday, when she has hips for Solara's sake. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, my lord. Shameless pimp. You needn't sound so orgasmic about it, farmer. The onlookers chuckled. Your daughter will serve for ten years. Ten years? The farmer asked. Was that a hint of derision in his tone? The governor's cheeks tightened as he leveled his gaze. The farmer's expression corrected course. Right, my lord. Ten years, starting her sixteenth. The heavy double doors to his right burst open, and a man in a forest green robe of high sheen swept into the room. Onlookers' eyes shifted, but the guards never flinched as his lieutenants approached the governor's chair. Kermatian Pyre. The Deathlock specialist was one of few magic users allowed this close to Zane. Since the Shadow Council formed over fifty years before, only those who had undergone levation were given access to the family grounds in Milbury Peaks. Then the blank slates freed of their memories served the same subjects who employed the concubines. 
The governor raised an ear as the warlock leaned down and whispered, We have the guardsmen from Trowsby, my lord. Ah! His goblet clattered to the stone floor, and he kicked it away. It bounced towards the feet of the farmer pimp. That is all for today. Return tomorrow and I shall hear your pleas. Zane burst past the caster. The doors flung open. Then he stomped down the hall on the other side. An ornate vase from the eastern continent of Lao, the same place from which he'd procured the priestess at great expense, perched on its surface. He spared it a passing glance before he swept around the corner and resisted the urge to fling it against the opposite wall. The swooshing sound of the warlock's robe reported his proximity. Where did the Cretan turn up? A guard in gleaming chain dragged open the heavy door, then Zane descended a spiraling stone stairwell. He fled to an inn outside Charlesby, a small town bordering the Plague Barons. Outpost 2. Ah, one of the old military camps. Yes, Governor, it is as you say. At the bottom of the stairs, the warlock stepped ahead of him to approach a heavy door fashioned of vertical wooden planks. Allow me, Governor. He removed a key from his robe pocket and rattled it into the lock. After a heavy click, the door swung open. A coppery stench wafted out, but it might as well have been jasmine for Zane's anticipation of the moment. On the other side of an unoccupied stone slab, with leather bindings for wrists and ankles, hung a stout man with his arms tied overhead. He was nude, except for a filthy loincloth. Ah, Zane circled the slab. You must be... He hesitated and leaned toward the warlock. Shiampu, the warlock whispered. Shiampu, right. You're a slippery prick, aren't you? The man's head hung limply. Did you already kill him, Pyre? No, Governor. Zane extended a long arm. Then wake him up. Pyre stepped forward, then backhanded the prisoner. What? The man shot awake and raised his head so fast it lulled backward. Blood caked where rivers had run from both nostrils. The flesh surrounding one eye shone purple and black. He focused the good one on Zane. Oh, governor. The words crackled in his throat. Mm-hmm. She ample. Did you not understand my order to return after you reported my nephew's death in Trowsby? What? No, my lord. I... Pyre, Zane said turning his back and waving a hand. The warlock raised one palm. A sphere of green light circled by black swirls of energy bloomed. Sheample's eyes went wide, but his pleas came weak. No, please! Pyre flicked his wrist, and the ball splashed into the prisoner's face. Sheample's flesh grayed, then blackened as worms of energy penetrated his skin that wriggled beneath. They stretched his flesh as they expanded down his neck and into his chest. Yeah, ah, ah! The prisoner screamed. The governor leaned toward Pyre so the deathlock would hear him. I like that one. It looks like it hurts. Oh, I am certain it does, governor. How long does it last? Half a minute, governor. Oh, well, gag him or something, would you? He's hurting my ears. The warlock scanned the room, but when he found nothing of use, he tore off the prisoner's loincloth and stuffed it in the screaming man's mouth. He flicked his eyebrows at the governor. Shame is the least of his concerns. Zane leaned against the stone slab and folded his arms across his chest. I despise this sort of thing. I take no pleasure in it. But we must set examples, don't you agree, Pyre? Yes, Governor. To flee like a coward as my own blood falls before him, then again when ordered to report? The man finally settled, and his head drooped again. Zane cocked his chin toward the prisoner, so Pyre yanked the rag free and dropped it. So, Shiampa, 
This man who Brazel Sneet swore he killed in Brumhill. You swore it was he who somehow reappeared and stabbed my nephew Stephen. The prisoner raised his head, then nodded before letting it drop. And a fair blonde accompanied him. Another weak nod. And you acknowledge you ran like a coward instead of fighting? The prisoner muttered something. What's that? Zane stepped closer. Speak up, man. Twas Formulot, adventuring types. I thought it important I report and gather reinforcements. Ah, I see. The governor eyed Pyre but spoke to the prisoner. But three of the four were women, and there were also four of you, were there not? Four trained soldiers? N n no, my lord. Uh, yes, my lord, but... Zane ripped a dagger from his belt and slammed it into the prisoner's belly. The man's head shot up, his eyes bulged, and his mouth gaped. Hands quaking with the effort of tearing through muscle and bone, Zane cut a curved swath from abdomen to chest, grunting with the effort. If you wanted to die like a man, you should have done it on the road. With a final jerk of the knife, he stepped back. The hilt protruded from Shiampo's right breast. Guttural sobs escaped the prisoner's lips as blood gushed from his wound, then his intestines splattered to the floor. Zane's knife clattered onto the stone slab behind him. Have someone clean and return it. By your order. Any word on the mage our friends visited at the university dormitories? None yet, Governor. We're still searching. But bounty hunters sent a runner last night. They believe the eastern woman and her supposed rescuers are south of Sarand, in a valley surrounded by high stone walls. Are you saying the lot are pinned down? Yes. I asked their leader, Mulk, to camp there until we can gather a force. He rallied some riffraff to our cause. Most are field hands and laborers, but the best we could expect from the southeastern territory. This Mulk sounds resourceful. Get one of our mages to open a portal and take a message to— He peered up at the hanging corpse. Have we learned the ingrate's name? Pyre cocked his head toward the hanging dead man. He did. The name is Fowler. He has a strange first name composed of numerals and letters. Strange indeed. But if memory serves, the legends claim many of the mythics had strange names. Extend an invitation. If he is what you think he is, he could be a valuable asset. If the traitor refuses. The governor laughed. Traitor? How could he be a traitor if he's a mythic? Doesn't legend contend they were unfamiliar with the customs of their adopted regions when they arrived two millennia ago? Perhaps he is an equally clean slate. Pyre cupped both hands in front of him and bowed slightly. As you say, my lord. Zane tapped the warlock's chest. Don't let your taste for death obstruct your perspective. If the legends are true and he is a Chenois, you can't kill him anyway. Read the annals and decide how to best deal with such a creature. I'll trust you to act accordingly, but I want him here, and the Eastern Whore as well. Yes, Governor. Oh, and this caster, the blonde who jumped from the parapets and vanished. Yes. Could she really be the one, the former magister? I have only the word of a clerk at the university. It wasn't until after his encounter that her familiarity struck him. But it makes sense that the mage Mora took flight if she figured out who the half-elf was. She knew we would inquire when word got to us that a long-sought-after traitor to the crown was spotted there. If she really is the long-lost Delphine, the king will reward us handsomely for her return. Speak with Mulk personally. Raise the bounty on Fowler and the half-elf. That should encourage him to hold his place until we can gather forces. Are forces necessary for such a small band? Perhaps I could handle it, Governor. I will not be caught by surprise. 
Delphine's resourcefulness is legendary. Giles Renard might be with them. Add a mythic to their mist, and there's no telling who they've recruited to their aid. No, I want their captures to be a certainty. As you say, my lord. One. The ground rumbled, and my feet shimmied in my boots as a gap cracked in the grassy surface to swallow the foundation stone. It tumbled into the dark soil, and the surface gave a violent jolt. Arms flailed as my party fought for balance. Then an eerie silence engulfed the valley as an orange hue bloomed in the cracks underfoot. Glowing veins webbed in all directions. Gazes met. Expressions slackened. Another violent quake. The sprawling plateau rumbled, then groaned as if a beast would rise from the widening gap. Roshan, Priya, and the goblins dropped onto their butts. Desini, Giles, and I kept our feet, maybe because of higher dexterity scores. The widened gap separated party members. Wisps of vapor burst into the sky. They slinked like worms and intertwined to form dark clouds winding around one another, blanketing the sun and washing the walled-in valley in shadow. The glow cast throughout the veins underfoot exploded across the grassy floor, and the orange wave of energy spread until it climbed the high stone walls on all sides. Gemini! Priya thrust out a finger. My hips strained against the tremors as I turned to spy a sapling rising from a crack twenty yards away on one side of the cave mouth. The tree climbed skyward, and its trunk thickened and cracked to form hard bark as branches stretched across the sky. Wooden fingers crept higher and wider. Crack! The massive oak split down the middle. Horizontal slits opened in its trunk. Segments formed planks edged by bark as crosscuts divided them further. The planks slid like a strange puzzle, dropped, rotated in different directions, then rejoined with each other. Powdered bark rained down. The grass retreated into the earth below as the soil flattened. A hard-packed dirt square formed, and wood slivers clanked into place to form a foundation. Blocks piled at the corners, then others stacked horizontally as if unseen beings labored. Then the higher wood and branches melded into an A-framed roof of serpentine beams. The ground thumped with the heavy bass of war drums, sending shock waves through the bottoms of my feet and into my knees as dust puffed into the air surrounding us. A whoosh of rushing water drew us to the edge of the plateau. At the bottom of the natural steps on the southern side of the valley, a chasm opened. Rising water flooded loose gravel, then formed a stream that ran from the northwest, then disappeared under the rock walls to the southeast. The chasm deepened and the water rose until I stared at a full-fledged river. The ground stopped shaking. This is magic as only Solara could will it, Roshan rejoiced from beside me. A footbridge shimmered into existence to cross the river from the field at the bottom of the steps to the corner where the shrine of a bird figure stood. Another formed further south. Then it was quiet. The earth settled. The clouds dissipated, and the massive sun's glow returned to the valley. Text flooded my heads-up display as victorious music filled the air. Congratulations! You have activated your foundation stone and created your home instance. The entries to your valley have become ethereal doorways. You have been granted a source of fresh water. Resource challenges have spawned to complement the natural resources found within the boundaries of your home instance. Clear these challenges to unveil resources to advance your foundation. Your master's cabin. Enter your master's cabin to retrieve your foundation guide. The master's cabin is your central management point where you can summon laborers, order defenders, and manage the construction of buildings and farms. Foundation Raids As you construct your foundation, other players can choose to raid replicas of your instance to conquer them for XP and rewards. Although unbound NPCs enter your unique instance for story purposes, a separate version will be created for players who seek conquest just like dungeons in Enora Online. 
If NPCs destroy buildings or kill your defenders, the changes will be reflected in player-rated versions. So gather your companions and defend your new home. Grace Periods You have a grace period of 2 days, 48 hours, before your home instance is unlocked to NPC raids. To account for time differences between Anora and the outside world, you have a grace period of 30 days Anoran time before your home instance is unlocked to player conquest. Rewards When foundation raids fail, you gain XP and rewards. So, build up your defenses and advance through the tiers to build your city. A bold yellow digital timer popped up on the top right side of my interface and began a countdown from 48 hours. Okay. This is so ultra badass I can hardly stand up. You smile like a troll who bathes in a lake of gold coins, Guile said. Why wouldn't I smile? I asked. We just laid our foundations... um, foundation. I thrust a finger toward the small building. Witness the wonder of your goddess's power. I do. Priya pushed to her feet then sprinted past me. I want to see... Lucius crawled onto her knees, stood, then dusted off her backside. She's a real pistol, that one. She rushed past the circle of bystanders to catch up to Priya. Her brother Charney, Desini, and Roshan followed suit. Warning. Unbound NPCs will be evicted from your home unless you invite them to your instance party within five minutes. If you wish to permit, Charney, half-goblin, Level 14, no class, and Giles Renard, elf, level 51, rogue. To remain, you must send an invite to this unique party channel. Herein lay one of my many problems. Prior to dropping the foundation stone, Sharni's sister had asked me to bind her. Sharni's irritable disposition toward me, which might have stemmed from my threat to cut his tongue out when he cursed at Rashan, didn't instill confidence he would join up. But Lucius was so sure she would eventually convince him. She'd had me bind her so she could receive the benefits. By that, she meant she wouldn't mind living forever. If I sent Sharni an invitation, he would inevitably notice if his sister had received one. Something about the matter-of-fact way she talked to her brother. I didn't think she'd lie about her binding of ten minutes before. Then the jig would be up. It would anger the male half-goblin, and his temperament toward me could grow even sourer. Mental note. Grow up. Have patience. Stop threatening people. Roshan can take care of herself. Evicting him from the instance would have the same result. Since I didn't want him suspecting anything until Lucius talked to him, I invited all the other members of my team to the instance party. Then I focused on Charney's back and invited him. When he stopped in his tracks and glanced back over his shoulder, I expected to see the typical sneer crossing his features. Instead, his cheeks were slack, his eyebrows slightly furrowed. I threw him a singular curt nod. After a quick glance at his sister, as she entered the cabin, he returned the nod and accepted the invite. Charney has accepted your instance party invite. To kick Charney from your instance, focus on the NPC and imagine him standing outside for three seconds. In the meantime, Guile stepped closer, set his hands on his narrow hips, and gazed at the area where the foundation stone had slipped into the dirt. The smooth blanket of grass gave no hint it had gaped moments before. After all these years, I slapped his shoulder. Yeah, you probably thought you'd never see it happen, huh? Giles shook his head, stepped off in pursuit of the others, then mumbled under his breath. Although I couldn't quite make out all his mutterings, I caught something about lucky human bastards. With all I'd survived since entering Enora and the sight of my people forming a line to investigate the new structure, I couldn't argue with the sentiment. I jogged to catch up and follow them through a door with golden hinges and four windows cut into its face. A cot on a sturdy wooden frame sat in the far right corner with its head beneath a small window cut into the far wall. The table centered in the cabin's lone room occupied about a third of the space. 
In its center sat a thick blue tome, whose trim glowed the same orange we'd seen wash across the plateau outside. Priya's lips stretched into a sideways smile when I entered. For all your arguments about my sitting on the stone throne, I can't even open the damned book. Seems Solara has other plans for our little community, Shenwa. I'd hoped to convince Priya I'd been sent to Honora to serve her rather than the other way around. Presenting the stone chair had been a scheme to ensure my freedom to gallivant around the countryside in search of dungeons, instead of being tied to the Foundation. But my efforts to suppress my emotions for the woman who shared them across mystical airwaves hadn't been as successful as I'd hoped. We had a baby coming. I wasn't certain I'd wanted to be gallivanting when it came along, and she detected the conflict. Now I saw what the Foundation really was. A real-time strategy nested inside an MMO. A real game-changer, pun intended. If I could advance while building a home for my companions and the coming spawn of my loins, the prospect could be a win-win. This still doesn't mean you are the guiding spirit of our team, I said. I just happen to be a mythic. She flickered her tongue out like a five-year-old. Giles reached across the table and set a hand on the volume, but he couldn't budge it either. I felt like Arthur approaching the sword in the stone. The elves stepped to the side and Giles motioned with one hand. It seems the privilege is yours, Shenwa. It annoys him when you call him that. Priya shot me a sideways grin. I couldn't care less. Priya shook her head and said, Then I'll call you that. She paused. When I didn't dignify her snark, she added, Even if only because I know it annoys you, Shenwa. I gripped the tome with both hands and lugged it off the table. Doing so, unfortunately, reinforced that I was special, but only because I was a player. You have discovered Foundations, an interactive guide to building your Anoran hearth and home. Would you like to deposit the Foundation guide into your interface's documentation library? Yes or no? When I focused on yes, the orange glow intensified. Then the thick book's leather binding and pages between disintegrated into motes of shimmering light, which rose into the air like sparks popping from a campfire. Foundations, an interactive guide to building your hearth and home, has been added to your library. You may share this document with your companions, but certain information will be omitted. Rashan's gaze followed the motes until they vanished near the ceiling. She made strange sweeping gestures with her hands, then kissed one thumb. Lucius thrusted her hands onto her hips. Who are you people? Yeah, what the hell, dudes? Sharni rang in. Priya bumped me with her hip. Hanging around with you is kind of neat sometimes. Table of Contents. Your Foundation. A preface to success. Resources. 1A. Stone. 1B. Wood. 1C. Gold. 1D. Metals. 1E. Cloth. 1F. Gems. Structures. 2A. The Master's Cabin. 2B. The Architect's Cabin. 2C. Sawmill. 2D. Smithy. 2E, quarries, 2F, mines, 2G, clothier's shop, 2H, wood shop, 2I, jeweler's cabin, 2J, stables, 2K, barracks, 2L, tannery, 2M, greenhouse, 2N, cook's kitchen, 2O, crop farms, 2P, dairy farms, 2Q, Trading Post. 2R, Fishery. 2S, Range. 2T, Spirit Towers. 2U, Proving Grounds. 2V, Mana Wells. Racial Abilities. 3A, Elves. 3B, Goblins. 3C, Humans. 3D, Mishon. 3E, Orcs. 3F. Ogres. Recruitment. 4A. 
the foreman, 4B, laborers, 4C, defenders, technology trees. And the list went on and on. No wonder the tome had been so thick. I wished there had been an auto-learn feature to channel all the information into my brain, but if I filled one hand with wishes and the other with crap, I knew which would weigh me down first. For all its wonder, and Nora fed me plenty of the latter. I scanned the preface. First things first, a preface to success. Welcome to your foundation. Never in the history of online gaming has a real-time strategy game of such depth existed inside a virtual, massively multiplayer online role-playing game until now. Foreman. Cost. 50 gold. Foremen are advisors sent from Solara's realm to aid adventurers in construction, research, recruitment, and myriad other tasks. Foremen are living encyclopedias of knowledge about foundations and what makes them tick. Although the cost of fifty gold might seem steep, a foreman's skill ranks across professions begin at level twenty. In addition, their ability to train laborers, players, and NPCs up to their skill level makes their return on investment, ROI, a nearly immeasurable boost to your foundation's productions. Note, foremen are non-combative. Note, adding a foreman provides an extra layer of security against successful raids because their capture is a victory requirement. Do you wish to hire a foreman? Yes or no? Opening my inventory, I checked my coin. 127 gold, 43 silver, 27 copper. Do you require counsel, Shinwa? Giles asked. Huh? I swiveled. What? By your distant gaze, I wonder if you need counsel. Oh, sorry. Supposedly I can transfer the document to you. Do you know how? Giles nodded. Open it. Focus on the document, and then push it through your interface toward me. I eyed the tome in my interface, reached up with one hand, then shoved it toward the elf. The book spun, then passed through space and shrunk before vanishing into Giles's forehead. A system message appeared. Error. Could not share foundations, an interactive guide to building your hearth and home with Giles. Only bound NPCs may read this document. I can't send it until you're bound. Ah, the elf's lips wrinkled down at the corners. Rather than add pressure about his decision to join up, I read it to him. By Solara's grace, what gifts abound? I know, right? Can I see? Priya asked. Interested to see if it would work, I ticked off the members of my party interface and shoved the book into space. Several copies spawned from the image, then spun toward them. Error. Could not share foundations, an interactive guide to build your hearth and home with Charney. Only bound NPCs may read this document. Oh, cool. I never knew humans could do this stuff. Lucius shook her head in amazement. Charney threw her a glare. What's cool? What can humans do? Uh-oh. The jig is up. I shot her a warning glare. She missed it. This guide, she answered her sibling. Why didn't you send it my way? Charney asked me. Oh, I see. I pissed you off so you don't want to share. I'm the outcast. Wait, if Giles isn't bound, and I'm not bound. The last thing I needed was another problem hanging over my head. Best to deal with it and get it behind us so we could all focus. Your suspicion is correct. Charney's glare reacquired his sister. Light yellow color flooded her green cheeks. What did you do? Lucius stepped toward the door. We can talk about it outside, Charney. The hell you say? Hey, Tick Turd, did you do that binding thing with my sister? Before I could reply, Rashan turned and slapped Charney on the back of his head. These are not the words of a creature of the light, fool. She shoved him toward the door and thrust a pointing finger. Out! Get out of this cabin! Out! Charney flinched and raised his hands. What the hell, lady? Lucius flung the opened door. 
Rashan's second shove sent Charney across the threshold. A new wind howled as the door swung. Lucius followed Rashan and Charney outside. Priya's mouth gaped, and one of Dasini's thin eyebrows arched high on a wrinkled forehead. Giles' expression remained flat. Wow, Priya said. I'm not sure Rashan likes the goblin. She's going to train him, Giles said. It seems his light affinity is high. How can you tell it's high? I asked. I tried to analyze him and couldn't get anything but his level and race because he isn't bound. You aren't the only one who knows how to whisper, Shenwa. He told her on the ridge above before we purged the Suisa from this place. I suspect your eastern companion longs to continue the tradition instilled by her teacher. Shouts filled the air outside, and though I couldn't make out the words over the wind, the varied tones made it clear all three parties were taking turns yelling. We should leave the priestess to deal with a new acolyte. Giles pulled the door so it latched. I explained the foreman concept and told him the cost. I strongly advise you to spend the gold. Agreed, Dasini said. If Solara would grace you with a soul from the domain of the life-giving son, you would be a fool to refuse. Spend the gold. You two sure are loose with my purse. Giles tapped a pouch hanging from his belt. I can contribute if it douses your reservations. I glanced at Priya. She shrugged. I was reading about spirit towers. What's it say? Foremen excel according to racial advantages. Only races you have discovered in Anora are available. Please choose a race for your foreman from the list below. Dwarf, plus ten smelting and smith skills by all summoned beings. Plus ten armor crafting. Minus ten percent smith blueprint discovery time. Elf, plus ten dexterity to all summoned beings. Plus ten percent hunting gains from all hunters. Minus 10% blueprint discovery time for wooden weapons and tools. Goblin, plus 10 engineering for foreman and goblin laborers. Minus 10% discovery time of all blueprints. Human, plus 10 construction efficiency for all laborers. Plus 10% defender attack. Plus 10% gains from logging. Michonne, plus 10 stamina. Plus 10% gains from all farming sources. Minus 10% laborer fatigue. Orc. Plus 10 strength to all summoned beings. Plus 10% mining and quarrying gains from all laborers. Plus 10% defensive structure HP. The gamer part of my brain wanted to rely on my experience and keep things simple. But a lazy brain equaled suffering in this world. On the other hand... I could spend all day and into the night researching the different races and bellyache over the decision. When I read through the list a second time, my mental trigger finger itched. Although I had the nagging suspicion this foundation-building thing was going to be huge and might someday be a great source of XP, especially when other players invaded instances of my stronghold, my primary concern was my combat party. We'd just run a dungeon in the Plague Barrens, my mind had swirled with recollections late into the night, reliving our battles and reveling in the ultimate victory in lieu of sleep. One reason I'd so enjoyed it was about five foot ten with a long tail and ears perched atop her head. Dasini was my front line. Her fluid movement, determined focus, and keen intuition proved her lack of experience was an unnecessary source of worry. My heart raced but not for the same reasons as when I was with Rashan or Priya. Sure, she was attractive and built like a pole vaulter, but she'd been through hell at the hands of men interested only in her body, and I never wanted her to fear that from me. My mission was gearing her to protect the group and ensuring she was trained to be the monster I knew she could become. Although I could spend countless hours considering a foreman's racial bonuses, my desire to see Dasini in shining thick plates of gold was the deciding factor. I was left with seventy-seven gold and change. Done. What kind did you choose? Giles asked. What, you don't like surprises? 
One side of my face curved into a smile. The opposite side of his curved into a smirk. A flourish of resounding strings filled the air as golden motes flooded the far wall and swept toward the center where they combined. A frame materialized with a thin wooden backing, and in its center, a double-sided hammer with thick silver trim framing a golden head was suspended by two metallic hooks. Gah! Dissini reached for the handle of her mace. The motion reinforced my earlier sentiments. The Michonne was always ready to throw down. So cool. I pulled the hammer from the wall. By investing in a foreman, you have earned Master's Hammer. No level requirement. Type, one-handed tool. 19 to 29 blunt damage. Scales with combat level. Quality, epic. Durability, unbreakable. When equipped, minus 15% armor, weapon, and smithy resource structure build times can be equipped by a foreman, the Foundation Master, or a bound companion of the Foundation Master's choice, bound to home instance. I described its detailed attributes. The cut in build times alone was worth the coin, I said. Bad assed indeed, Priya said. Hey, you said that right, I mocked. She flipped me the bird. I held out the hammer to Dasini as I stuck my tongue out at Priya. The Michonne grasped it. Awe painted her face as she tested its significant weight with short swings. What are these things on the back? She tapped a finger on the claw. It hadn't occurred that the hammer's common design in my world might not have been familiar to citizens of Enora. It's a claw to remove nails from wood, I said. If you have nails with flat heads, they slide into the slit there, then you can pry them out. You will have to show me that, master. She handed the hammer to Giles, who tested its weight in the same way the Michonne had. He cleared his throat. Now, where is the foreman? Do you see a timer, Shenwa? Call me Gemini and maybe I'll answer. Do you see a timer, Gemini? Giles asked with none of the irritation I'd expected. The elf had adopted the patient tone of a mentor ever since I'd asked him to be part of this enterprise. No. You're insufferable. Okay. Maybe not always patient. Loud hollers outside brought my head up. I gazed out the side window just in time to spy Rashan rushing up the slight incline of the plateau toward the cave. I cocked my chin toward the window. I think that answers your question. 2. The high sun draped the figure's face in an impenetrable shadow as he lingered just inside the cave's threshold, but his stout shoulders bulged in his simple work shirt, powerful legs bowed slightly as if he'd spent his adulthood on horseback, thick hands open and closed as if his summoning left them in need of a good stretch. Rashan charged up the hill with her staff raised high, and to my utter surprise, Charney rushed forward in her wake. The goblin clutched the handle of a Kirby club in one hand. The light priestess's hair twirled in the wind as she ascended the slight incline to the cave. I wondered what she thought she'd do. Smite him to death? We'd have to discuss her relative weakness compared to combat classes sometime soon. Lucius hung back and waited for the rest of us to flood out of the cabin, but I charged past her with Giles in tow. Rashan, Stop! He's one of ours! Stop! Although she came to a halt, the glowing surrounded her staff as she raised it high, signaled she hadn't heard a word. I pay fifty gold for a foreman, and my priestess is going to smite him right out of the gate, or cave, as the case might be. Instance party, Gemini. Stop, Rashan, he's our foreman. The glow receded as she interrupted her cast, but Charney continued past her with his club raised. Instance party, Gemini. Rain in the goblin. But it was too late. Charney charged by her, raised his club, and passed into the shadows. The thick figure stepped into the darkness as the half-goblin charged, and I grimaced while staring into the black mouth of the cave. A moment later, Charney careened back into daylight as his arms flailed and slung through the air to tumble onto the grassy plateau. A huff escaped the little goblin's lips when his back thumped the ground. Doh! 
Priya and I exclaimed in unison. Lucius raised a hand to her mouth and uttered a muffled cry, but I just chuckled. Looks like our new foreman isn't completely helpless, Giles said. The elf marched past me and up the hill. Yeah, I guess non-combatant doesn't mean he can't hand out an ass-whooping. I peered down at Lucius and smiled. Between his response to our rescue of him at the river and the way he just charged our new ally, your brother makes for a hell of a welcoming committee. Humph! <laughs> Lucius strolled up the hill and away. Your holy woman was at least ten paces in front of him by my accounting, Shenwa. The last word dripped with sarcasm. I liked the little half-goblin chick. Though Lucius stood only a couple of inches shorter than Priya, who reached just a couple inches over five feet, by my best guess. And although she was actually cute with her big eyes and full cheeks, the idea of lusting over a short green woman struck me as uncouth. At the same time, she was half-human, which meant someone in a previous generation hadn't been as selective. I shook my head again at my inner narrative and hustled up the hill. The stout foreman stepped out of the shadows. A prominent round nose hanging from a thick bridge centered his face, and bushy eyebrows matched the black of his long, thick beard that twisted into a braid running down his chest. He didn't have to bend far to get a fistful of Sharni's patchwork shirt with a thick hand and yank him off the ground. The tips of the goblin's sandals only flirted with the ground below. Hey, then who does this little one belong to? The foreman asked in a stereotypical Scottish accent. Hey, stop your squirming, you little beast. I'm not gonna hurt ya. He set Charney down, dusted off his shoulders, and peered around. Which of you, sir, is G3M1N1? He asked. It's Gemini. I stepped forward and shoved my hand out. My bones crackled in his grip. Pulo Thickfinger, level 20 foreman. Your foreman comes with preset rankings that advance with activity and all his professional and gathering skills begin at rank 20. The foreman's skills advance more quickly than the average adventurer, but he cannot participate in combat or be attacked. Strength, 10. Dexterity, 10. Intelligence, 20. Wisdom, 10. Constitution, 20. Charisma, 10. Professional skills, blacksmithing, 20. Carpentry, 20. Clothier, 20. Cooking, 20. Leather crafting, 20. Alchemy, 20. Gathering skills, botany, 20. Fisher, 20. Forestry, 20. Gemology, 20. Mining, 20. Quarrying, 20. Skinning, 20. Trapping, 20. I lad. Pleased as a forgel in feces to meet ya. Forgel? He flipped a finger at the goblin. Keep that glare plastered to your oversized eyes, and I'm likely to thump you out of the valley one kick at a time. His chest rumbled with thunderous laughter, as if he hadn't just threatened Sharney with a bruising he'd never forget. Thick finger? I added. What kind of a name is? Gah! Of all the lads in Anora. Solara sticks me with a dense one, be it just my luck. Rashan squinted. He doesn't speak like a servant of Solara. Her tone dripped with suspicion. Aye, and how would this lass know how a spawn of Solara should talk? Met many of us, have ye? No. Then maybe you'll be better served getting to know someone instead of prejudging, huh? Rashan pinched her lips together, but closed her eyes and nodded concession of the point. The foreman turned his attention back to me. So you want to show me the master's cabin, or are we going to stand around jabbering all day? I turned to one side and gave a sweeping gesture toward the small structure just down the slight incline. Right this way, foreman thick finger. He looked past Priya to the cabin, then did a double take. Aye, and who might this little blossom of perfection be? I rolled my eyes. Pulo took a long step, which didn't amount to much on stubby legs, then pulled Priya's hand to his lips. How I missed the blinding glare of a sun like yourself is beyond me, lass. 
Got the name for old Pulo and that pretty head of yours somewhere? Priya. Her cheeks filled with deep color. Priya Sky. Ah! The dwarf stepped back and dropped her hand. Throwing his arms across his waist, he bowed deeply. My apologies, my lady. I should have realized you were the spawn of the great Jara, matron of the wood, the moment I seen you. You'll forgive this servant's petulance. One side of her nose crinkled up in reply. Let's not discuss the matron of the wood, I said. A sore spot. The dwarf's head lolled in a slow, backward sweep. Ah, mothers and daughters, understood. He flashed Priya a wide smile and a slighter second bow. Perhaps you'd do me the honor of a tour, lady. Priya blushed again, and we set off across the sprawling land that formed the platform atop the natural steps in the valley. Pulo threw his hand to one side. You I know of. Giles Renard, right? Giles nodded and clutched the hand. Guess your reputation precedes you, Master Giles, I said. He didn't respond, which didn't surprise me. Pulo's gaze darted around at the female specimens, pausing long and hard on Asini's tail. You surround yourself with fierce ones, I see. If that's supposed to be sarcasm, you should see that one in a fight. She's a monster, natural born. Heh, <laughs> go figure, the dwarf replied. Michonne are known for their agility and speed. Not surprising, actually. What's her role? The Cine responded, though she didn't bother to look back. I'm two paces in front of you, Pulo Thickfinger. Why not ask me instead? Aye, I like this one. He nudged me with his elbow as we approached the cabin door. What's your role, Lady Michonne? I'm a front-line fighter, what my master calls a tank. Pulo's chin tipped up. You didn't see fit to wield a bow or dagger, then? Why do you seem surprised? I asked, with the hint of a smile creeping at one corner of my lips. With such high dexterity, counts, you'd think... Pulo's eyes winked in succession. By the way his pupils danced left to right in his head, I knew he was reading her stats. Gads! She's a fierce one! So many naturally learned attribute advances. The Lady Michonne strikes me as one who rests not on her laurels. I chuckled. Yeah, no kidding. This time to Sydney turned her head when she addressed the foreman. You continue to speak of me as if I were not two steps ahead of you. Priya flung the door open and stepped aside, gesturing for the dwarf to enter. Pulo bowed. Oh no, my esteemed Countess of the Wood. Please, after you. Priya blushed deeper. I thought the blood might harden in her cheeks. We crowded inside and spaced out around the table. The dwarf glanced around, scratched his bearded chin, then nodded. So, just getting started. Good. You didn't have the chance to twist things up before old Pulo came along. I'm so relieved, I muttered. You will be. He thrust a finger at the hammer I'd shoved between my belt and hip. First order of business. You need a proper tool belt for that little gem. Second order of business. I need a tool belt so I can hold it when the master ain't around. He guffawed, but no one else seemed to get the joke. A thick shoulder hunched in a half shrug. Third order of business. Chairs for this table. After you get busy with hammers, saws, and mining picks... You'll value a chair more than you'd ever know. He thrust a finger toward the blank wall on the opposite side of the cabin from where the hammer had materialized. Focus here, Master Gemini. What am I focusing on? The tip of my finger will do. Got it? Sure. Good. Now open your map and focus on the home instance. It should now lock into your sight line since it is no longer just the valley in the larger open world. I did. The high cliffs towering over the raised plateau and natural steps came into view from an eagle's perspective. The wind blew silvery waves across the grass. Good. Now shove that image over to this spot on the wall near your hammer's supports. He lowered his finger. I shoved the image in my inner face with one hand. 
The map copied itself, and the transparent replica flipped end over end until it met the surface of the wall. Unlike the map in my heads-up display, the result was a flat, two-dimensional image appearing as if it was painted in watercolors. Oohs and ahs filled the room. I can oversee production, run research tasks, and the like from here. This way you can focus on other objectives, should your lordship desire. I'm no lord. But I'm going to call you what I call you, so you'd best get used to it. Can you see through that, class? Huh? I asked if my meaning was clear to you. I nodded. Crystal. Good. At least you ain't slow. How much of the Foundation Guide have you read? The preface up to the point where it said I should pay for your services. Best damn gold you ever spent. But don't take my word for it. I'll show you. I have little doubt. Ah, taking a shine to old Pulo already, then. Good. The goddess will be pleased. I know I come off as abrupt, but ye should all know I serve the master, and, by proxy, all bound to him. I am a strict foreman, and I don't accept half a behind's effort from any laborer with the whole backside. But I'm fair, and I think there's none so low as those who beat their laborers. He squinted one eye in Sharni's direction. Except for certain goblin laborers. They can be a trifle blunt for my taste. Bite me, Charney said. Ah, but then I'd have only a snack when you could be out hunting me up some meat. Charney fumed. I liked the dwarf. Anyways, I'd suggest binding yourself to the master as soon as you can. Why's that? Charney asked. The dwarf stepped forward and leaned down. Because I sense your nature, boy. And if ye's bound to the master, I can't beat ye. Charney shuffled a step back. Point taken. He glanced at me. We'll talk? I nodded. Good. None of ye have time for dilly-dallying. Soon you'll face challenges, and we need to get this empty box of a valley up and running before then. So, is the master the kind who likes to read late into the night? His eyes flicked every woman in the room. Or is it like I suspect, and he likes to busy himself in other ways? He raised his hand to quell my objection before it half rose in my chest. I'm teasing you. Take no offense. I like to keep things light. At least it'll never be boring. So, tell me. You want me to give you the rundown, or do you want to read it? Since everyone's here, Giles interjected, I think an overview is warranted. That way we can all drill down into the details in our own time, but we have your expertise to get us started. The elf I'd adopted as my mentor spoke sense, but I had every intention of getting deep with the tome in my library later. All right, then, Pulo clapped his hands. Let's get this class started. Three. We stood in a semicircle facing Pulo, two hundred yards from the bottom of the steps, retrieving Priya's axe from my bag, then two shiny new ones I'd bought in Trollsby, I made a pile at the dwarf's feet. Aye, they're a bit low for me, but tisn't I who needs to practice, is it? He chuckled. Who among you has experience cutting wood? Priya, Giles, and Dasini threw up their hands though the half-elves raised with less enthusiasm, as if encumbered by a stone glove. All eyes turned to Rashan. My skills are in the light and in extracting gems and metal from rock. My carpentry skill is only rank ten, and my forestry skill is but nineteen. I have little desire to increase either when my higher skills would better serve our encampment. I offer my gemology and mining skills instead. Pulo nodded. I lass, I hope you have high skills if you're choosing your own work. What are you currently rated in mining in gemology? Rashan raised her chin. I'm a journeyman miner and one skill point from master. My gemology skill is forty-three. Oh, the dwarf replied. A master gemologist in our midst, then. Well, double my skill level should suffice. Very nice, priestess. He gave a short bow. Now we just need to find you a mine. He glanced toward the dark cave mouth atop the steps and winked. Speaking of gems, he turned his eyes on Priya. What might be your forest skill, your eternal grace? 
My forestry is master level, and I can cook up a mean stew. What's your cooking skill? Forty-eight. Two fine skills of which we will make much use, a thought occurred. Do you lack the ability to check their skills? I asked. Can't you inspect them? Oh, yes, Master Gemini. I just didn't want to appear rude. I told you, Rashan said, giving my shoulder a light shove. Cultures differ, I replied. Hmph, <laughs> maybe less evolved cultures. Besides, he inspected the Sinni's combat levels when we approached the cabin earlier. Ah, giving away my secrets, then? Pulo eyed me. I don't care, Dasini said with a half-shrug. It's not like he fondled me. Pulo's facial muscles went taut. I would never, I sighed. Does anyone object to giving our foreman permission to check your interfaces? Heads shook. There were no dissenters, not even Charney. Thank ye, Pulo said. Your trust will serve, I promise. Meantime, it seems Priya will be the one to cook, if she has no objection. Master Giles might make a good lumberman. He turned to the high rock wall and pointed at the towering pines that stood atop it. Eventually we'll want to cut into those and bring them down. The oaks growing around this valley are fine for construction, so we'll start here. Meanwhile, you seem to have plenty of stone. We'll need to fashion a quarry. Stone? Charney asked. Yes, stone. See ye the wall behind ye? They'll never run out. I notice how you say they'll never run out. You're unbound, goblin. Need I keep reminding ye? No? Good. Pulo set his hands on his hips and leaned down again. Maybe you wonder why I'm hard on ye. Not really. So I'll tell ye. It's because loyalty marks a man's character in my book. If you had any idea the significances of the people and place surrounding you and respect the blessings of your own inherent gifts, you wouldn't hesitate to pledge fealty to the master of this instance. It speaks to your slow judgment. Pulo, Kyle said. Yes, Master Elf. While I see a certain logic in your reasoning, perhaps you could tune your tone to better respect our new companion. Charney has known us but for the better part of a day. Just because his sister more readily desired bonding to the Shenwa doesn't mean he is lax in his loyalties. Perhaps the goblin prefers to be more methodical in his decision-making. Forever is a long time, after all. Pulo gazed at Giles for about five heartbeats, then turned a squinted eye on Charney. Never let it be said your foreman is thick-headed. The elf is right. Charney, they call you. Fine. I'll lend you the time to consider your own decisions. But you can't work for me until you're one of the bound. So if you plan to hang around unbound, all I ask is you try not to get in the way. Agreed? Mm-hmm. Good. He clapped the goblin on the shoulder. Charney tumbled to the earth. Pulo grabbed his shoulder and raised him as if his weight were equal to a half sack of potatoes. Dick. Charney mumbled. Urshan dusted Charney's shoulders with a few quick slaps. I will ensure his labor doesn't interfere with others. Glad that's settled, I interjected. What's next? Have you entered the cave since your instance formed? I shook my head. Nope. Ah, I noticed points of interest were flagged on your map in the cabin. Three are inside the cave. You'd do well to explore. You have been offered a quest, a cave of wonders. Objective, go to the tunnels inside the cave and inspect their entrances. Reward, 500 XP. Okay, we can do that. Anything else while you have us out here? Scanning the high wall, I teetered with a touch of vertigo. I just wanted to show you two of your major resources, wood and stone. In the coming days, we'll use them to get your foundation started. If you'll give me leave, I'd like to survey your home instance as well as journey up to the cliffs there to see what kind of wood I might find. You mean the tops of those cliffs are inside the instance boundaries? I asked. Oh yes, Master Gemini. The boundaries spread north and south a bit, and as your foundation grows, 
they will expand in all directions. How else could you build a city? A city? The thought is mesmerizing. You think big, Pulo. I like that. I clapped his shoulder. Fair enough. Feel free to survey at your leisure, and we'll meet up when you're finished. Thank you, Master Dwarf. Ha! <laughs> I be not the master here, Gemini, but I thank you for the courtesy all the same. The dwarf turned and strode away in thudding footfalls as we made for the steps. Now you know how I feel about titles, I muttered at his back. We followed the left tunnel at the fork to enter the cavern with the stone chair I was coming to think of as the great room. Three tunnels had forked off this room, leading deeper into the caverns when we'd first arrived, but now motes of differing colors twirled in spirals at their mouths. Pedestals with glowing runes in their tops matched the colors of the motes. Instances within an instance. What's next? Red motes swirled in the left mouth. The centers were gold, the right green. It's like some kind of horizontal traffic light. I wonder if that's a clue as to a difficulty. When I inspected each instance, I resolved it was merely coincidence. Upon inspecting the first, I received a system message. You have completed the quest, a cave of wonders. Go to the tunnels inside the cave and inspect their entrances. Reward, 500 XP. Celebratory timpani burst into the air around us as a golden flash surrounded Charney and funneled into the sky above. Number 15 appeared in glowing bold numbers and zoomed into the distance until it vanished. Charney has reached level 15. Charney, half goblin, level 15, no class. Attributes, strength, six. Dexterity, four. Intelligence, two. Wisdom, one. Constitution, ten. Charisma, two. Now that he's reached level 15, Charney has earned five attribute points. Charney has 51 unspent attribute points. You may spend up to five attribute points for Charney. In order to spend more attribute points, NPCs above level 10 must be bound to you. The number of points available then is determined by their disposition toward you. People in Anora increase their attributes through repetitive life activities. For example, laborers who carry heavy loads will gain strength and foot messengers increase their stamina pools. Darney's attributes reflect these gains. Something was missing from that final system explanation. I had the vague recollection that Rashan had received attribute rewards in intellect and constitution when she advanced to levels 9 and 10. At the time, she hadn't been bound. So, it wasn't until now that I realized NPCs could receive attribute points aligned with their classes like I did, but only if they'd had trainers to assign their points and present them a combat profession. Sometimes the rules seemed tricky, but I couldn't argue they weren't detailed. When I bound to Cinny, she'd selected no class. As such, she'd received no automatic attributes, just a number in her pool to be spent. But even after I'd bound her, none of her attributes were auto-assigned. So I could infer that, after level 10, NPCs no longer received the automatic assignments. In this way, Enora would encourage untrained NPCs to sign on with mythics who would someday flood the world. I'd so naturally come to accept the mechanics of the world around me, recently I'd almost forgotten I was playing a game. Lucius threw her arms around her brother. Congratulations! A level! Her voice echoed down the tunnel and into the daylight. I wondered if the dwarf would hear. Though I'd spent exactly six attribute points on Lucius to bind her, a lack of magical affinities and combat skills prompted me to suggest we revisit the rest later. I needed to know how she envisioned aiding us in our growth as a team, and whispering on the down low in a cave hadn't been the best time. How did I level? Charney asked. As the dwarf likes to point out, we aren't bound. My guess, I said, is you leveled because you were in my instance party when I picked up the quest. Oh. His eyes blinked in succession and flicked to the right. Oh, here it is. So this is what quests look like. Well, thanks then. In fifteen levels, you've never completed a quest? So? None of my people complete quests. All of yours do? 
His eyes made the rounds. My messenger deliveries were presented to me as quests, the Sinni said. I didn't have quests until I met Gemini, Priya replied. Huh, I guess goblins don't get the love of the goddess like the rest of you. I wondered about his light affinity. Despite his chilly demeanor, a warmth washed over me whenever I was near him. Although I didn't know it would happen, I'm glad you finished your first quest. Congrats on your level. I gave him a thumbs up, but the gesture seemed to confuse him. Rashan's desire to pass on the light to the goblin might bring opportunities, but first I needed to know he was committed. I decided I would work through Rashan and Lucius, since they seemed best equipped to deal with him. He hates them less than everyone else. The goblin siblings went off on their own. I guessed they'd finished the discussion they'd been having before the foreman appeared, but Rashan stayed with the rest of us as we inspected the instance doorways covering what had been tunnels. The light priestess handled the green motes, Priya the gold in the center, and I took the red on the left. Once my hand was set on the pedestal, my interface flooded with text. I read it to them. Foundation challenge. Mining. Objective. Clear this tunnel to unlock a mine rife with copper, tin, and randomly spawned nodes of varying materials. The tunnel will wind deeper, revealing new metals as your foundation advances. Random gem nodes will also spawn here. Reward. 11,000 XP. Timed resource spawning. Level cap. 25. Max party size. 4. Levels are not automatically adjusted in this instance. Rashan turned away from her cave on the far side. Her features glowed with excitement. Gemini, this one states that clearing it will unlock a storehouse outside and give us a choice between a library or a vault in this location. This time I noticed when the quest auto-shared, a new feature that explained why Charney'd leveled. It was weird he hadn't been asked to accept the quest, but Anora did a lot of things her own way. Foundation challenge, storage, plus. The rest was as Rashan stated, with the same XP bonus of 11,000. Although I was getting where that much XP wasn't as impacting as it would have been my second day in Jara's Dark Wood, Rashan was bound to do some catching up. Well, that's a no-brainer. Gotta clear that. This one says it's a surprise, Priya mumbled in a disappointing tone. My luck is crap lately. You could still be in a forest by yourself. She wrapped her hand around her stomach and grimaced. I gripped her bicep, then raised an inquisitive eyebrow, but she waved me off. So, I set my hand on the waist-high pedestal whose glowing rune was cut into a triangle that matched the moat-filled swirl of gold. Foundation Challenge. Solara's Gift. Objective. Bring your ingenuity and clear this challenging area to unlock a gift from Solara. Prerequisite. You must complete the mining and storehouse challenges to unlock Solara's gift. Reward. 11,000 XP. Timed resource spawning. Level cap. 25. Max party size. 4. Levels are not automatically adjusted in this instance. It looked like Charney wouldn't be getting the XP, whether he had the quest or not. There must be something kick-ass in there, considering we have to clear the other two to unlock it. Priya wrapped an arm around my waist and leaned in to whisper. Does the level cap thing mean Giles can't go? Giles chimed in. You forget I share your elven ears. And you forget I'm a half-blood. I don't have elven ears, just the eyes, she retorted. I pivoted. The cap is 25 and adventurer levels aren't automatically adjusted. Giles stepped forward. Elven ears and eyes apparently forgotten. I've never heard of such a thing. He poked the pedestal with two fingers, and despite his advanced age, his lips moved silently as he read. An interesting quirk. Well, it sucks, I said. Hmm, maybe. But together, you, Desini, Priya, and Roshan make up a perfect foursome. Two damage dealers a frontline fighter, and a healer. I suspect Solara grants the opportunity for this reward with a purpose in mind. Besides, that amount of experience will benefit me a little, while your priestess will inevitably advance. From my brain to your lips, partner, we'll start knocking these out tomorrow morning. 
I itched to jump in head first, snag the resource rewards, and start collecting. But I'd played enough real-time strategy games to know players often needed a few practice runs to get the best understanding of the technology trees to most quickly build their bases. Some structures would serve as prerequisites for others. Certain materials would be required to build those, and unique tools would be needed to gather those resources. If we'd need to prioritize wood, then we already possessed the tools and our time would be best spent outside chopping trees. If Fulo thought metals would play an important part in the early going, then we'd clear the mine instance. If the storehouse served as a prerequisite for a bunch of other advantageous technologies, we'd go that direction and clear the instance on the far right. But I'd hired a foreman, and he was out surveying our territory, so instead of going off half-cocked, I'd be patient for once. Giles turned on his heels and paced toward the mouth of the cave. In the meantime, I'll go speak with our foreman about how I might contribute to our new home. He raised a hand over his shoulder. Come, Sister Priya. I'd also like to scout the ridge above so we can know the boundaries of our new home and see if any herds were swept up in the creation of the instance. If you're feeling up to it. She leaned into me and squeezed with an arm she'd slung around my waist. I returned the squeeze and kissed the top of her head. That's a good idea. We'll need food. Priya puckered her lips and stood on her tiptoes. When I lowered my cheek, she gave it a long, wet kiss. Then she grimaced again. Are you okay? I eyed the midsection she'd favored moments before. But then she scrunched her nose and rubbed her lips. Your beard is scratchy. You'll have to shave it or grow it, but it cannot stay so scruffy and short. I'm glad to hear you've decided about my grooming habits. You're alluring when you smile at me like that. She sighed and set her hand on her chest, leaning her head to one side as she stepped away. Shame I have business. She waved her fingers as if tickling the air over one shoulder. Both half-goblins fell in behind her. I attributed the bounce in Lucius's step to her brother's having gained a level. No sooner was Priya out of sight than Dasini adjusted her shorts around her waist so my eyes were drawn to her bare six-pack. It was like she did a thousand crunches per day. She slapped her palms on her hips. So, what should we do, master? Roshan interrupted her gaze over my shoulder down the dim tunnel leaning back to the plateau. Well, I should probably go see about setting some standards with Charney. I pushed out my bottom lip. If you must. Yeah, Dissini's head swept subtly side to side. He's wound up so tight he's going to snap like twine. I nodded. And Rashan's the one with the patience for his mouth. You would do well to garner some of our own, Gemini. But I will go and deal with the little green ones. Rashan quipped, then patted my cheek. I like the beard. You look less like a boy. She cocked her chin high and floated out of the cave. Then it was just to Sinny and me. What would you think of coming back to the master's cabin? I know we have Pulo, but we should do our own reading, and I wouldn't mind having you nearby to strategize. If we come from a position of knowledge, we can ask him the right questions. What do you think? The Sinny's lips stretched into a quarter moon, revealing the top row of her sharp, pearly teeth. I welcome your partnership. It's nice to be seen as more than an exotic toy. I tipped my head in a subtle bow. Understandable. No, you're valued. Her hand rested on my forearm. Thank you, master. After a light squeeze, she slipped around me and her tail waved high from left to right as she disappeared around a turn in the rocky tunnel. The afternoon sped by, and the outer edge of the sun met the high cliffs as we emerged from the cave. Dasini waited outside her tail still swaying as she gazed over her shoulder. She flipped her hand behind her. I grasped it, then she led me to the cabin. I was surprised by her sudden comfort with common touching. I hoped I was right that the affections were a sign of a deepening of our trust. On our way to the stout wooden structure, we passed Rashan, who sat with the goblins on the second natural step, their elbows set behind them, so they leaned with the remnant of the day's northwestern sun warming their faces. The eastern woman glanced over her shoulder, 
and I thought I saw the hint of a smile at the corners of her lips when she spied Dasini leading me. She turned her face back to the warming orange glow. The smaller windows in the master's cabin faced south and east, so it was dimmer inside as we entered with the sun at our backs. Dasini relaxed her gentle grip so my hand fell away. Then she crossed to the map. I plopped down on the cot in the corner. The wood squealed beneath my weight. I scratched the canvas's dry surface and thought I'd need to put a fur on the cot before anyone could doze there comfortably. Then again, I've seen these people sleep in worse conditions. The Michonne swept her hand across the map and zoomed out. I popped open my HUD to the document library. Scanning the table of contents, I focused on a topic related to the thoughts I'd had in the cave about collecting resources. 4B. Recruiting Laborers The Foundation Master, any bound companion designated by the Foundation Master, and the Foreman can recruit laborers from the Master's Cabin. When inside the cabin, the Recruitment sub-tab appears under the Foundation tab of your heads-up display. Freshly spawned laborers and guardsmen appear in the Master's Cabin unless the Foundation Master or Foreman has set a new rally point elsewhere in the home instance. I'd taken advantage of a system message offering me to bind my party to the Great Room when the last of the bird-like Swisa who'd held the valley left the area. I noted in the documentation that bind points for laborers and defenders could be set to different locations. I'd watched enough laborers killed in real-time strategy games as an invading force wiped the earth with them to know better than spawn them out in the open. Destroying an enemy's laborers hampered their ability to collect more resources and repair buildings during an attack. It was an invader's smart strategy against a defender's stupid mistake. I'd just as soon have everyone bound to the cave. We could buy ourselves time as enemies climbed the grass-topped rock stairway, atop which the master's cabin also rested. The darkness of the cave could also be an advantage if we came under fire. My party could see in the dark, except the goblins. I hadn't asked them if they needed torches at night in the cave where they dwelled before meeting us. Opening my interface, I focused on the new foundation tab and found the recruitment sub-tab. Nodding to myself, I returned to the document with a thought. The tabs vanished and the digital paper resembling yellow-stained parchment returned. Recruiting laborers cost coin. Although a sufficient number of laborers can be summoned to build a solid base for the master's foundation, the cost increases with each laborer recruited. Note that gold and other valuables harvested from nodes inside the instance cannot be traded for laborers inside the home instance but coin for this purpose can be earned at a trading post when your foundation has reached level 3 and become a hamlet. Defenders can be summoned with gold collected from a mine, if you have one available. See trading posts here. See gold mines here. See defenders here. I grasped that recruiting would be a general pain in the rump the more laborers or defenders I spawned, so I skipped the links for the time being. The door flung open. Pulo's silhouette filled the entryway. Jacini glanced over her shoulder, then returned to her study of the map. Ah, the master has returned to his cabin. I stood and faced the dwarf. How'd the survey go? All done? Aye, master Gemini. Tis quite a plot you've got here. High defensive walls doubling as resource nodes with massive pines atop them. A veritable forest of oaks and maples on the valley floor. The cave makes for a good fallback point, though I don't much take to adventurers falling back, if you can. I smiled. I prefer to kick ass as well. I decided not to share my earlier sentiments about spawn points in this context. And we should get along fine. Aye, just fine. The laborers will need a place to hide, so it will suit. A mind reader. Pulo continued. When you pass the end of the channels to the west and north, You'll see rolling hills as far as your eyes permit. Very few trees in either direction. Any invaders coming from those directions would be easy to spot if you set guard posts beyond the ethereal doorways at the end of the channels. He meant the instance entrances, like those found outside any dungeon. The drawback is you can't take summoned laborers or defenders outside, so you'd have to bring natural-born people like yourself to build and man those. 
Should I infer we aren't seeing what's actually going on outside, even though the door appears transparent? I asked. Infer thusly. The compartmentalization of these foundations from the outside world, so players couldn't summon armies inside and then bring them out to wreak havoc, was plain good logic. Otherwise, we'd have hordes flooding out of the instances and swarming across the countryside to conquer everything in sight. Well, unless there was a defender population camp. On the flip side, I could recruit more NPCs from the outside world of Enora and build an even better army inside. That might take years, though. As to the inside, though, Pulo said with a long draw of the final word, as if he'd noticed I was daydreaming. Right, go ahead. I'd normally frown on all this low ground with the surrounding cliffs looming over us, but the cliffs are so high and distant from the central plateau and the cave. Bombardment would prove an impressive feat with anything less than a king's army. Even then, I paced from your outer walls to the cave, and I've never heard of a catapult that could shoot that distance. Even if they could reach... We could ring the gathering bell outside the cabin and huddle the laborers inside the tunnels. The flat, rocky top of that cave could withstand anything. You'll get a stunning view of your valley from there as well. Well, that all sounds like good news. Aye, it is. But invaders would have problems getting to the cliffs once they entered the instance anyway. When we expand to a hamlet, and later, a borough, the expansion of your territory will leave more room for heavy armaments to roll through the gap between the instance door and the rock so they could maneuver up the hills to the cliffs. But by then, we'll have archer and flame towers up there. I'd yet to share with Pulo that we likely had bounty hunters out en masse searching for us because of our brazen rescue of Roshan. If it wasn't bad enough, we'd pissed off the governor of this region by stealing her back and killing his nephew on the road. The mercenaries Giles predicted would inevitably show up. If the likelihood the governor would send troops wasn't a scary enough prospect, King Latrell could also get wind of a mythic running around the countryside causing havoc. Inciting the wrath of the king's regent was one thing, but something told me royal attention would be the worst circumstance of all. Time was an uncertain quantity, and trouble was headed our way. This particular game's AI wasn't going to let us rest on our laurels for long.